Bonjour! We're gonna learn about the European Union now! Enjoy it! This video will look at the European Union and the spread of democracy. If we should compare things in the right order, we should compare the European Union to the United States or China because they're very large economies. Current numbers are roughly the United States having about 20 trillion in GDP and the European Union about 18, sniffing on a 19 perhaps, and um, China is uh, almost 14 trillion dollars strong. These are important economies. So it's no surprise that Russia, China, United States are looking at the European Union at its full potential. Now, a big problem is that the citizens of um, the European Union are not quite aware of it. The solidarity between Sweden and Italy or Spain and Finland is quite different. They don't feel like one country. They feel like they're different countries under one flag. But if you look at a European Union passport. It says the European Union, and then underneath it says the state of Sweden or the state of Ireland and so on. But on top, it is the European Union. They have about 500 million citizens. Their military spending is uh, roughly 1.4% of GDP. They have roughly 1.4 million uh, individuals in service they're not active though uh, they have deployable forces of about a half a million uh, they have uh, several aircraft carriers lots of uh, destroyers uh, frigates corvettes and so, so on uh, a bunch of m submarines lots of tanks lots of artillery lots of helicopters lots of fire jets and lots of refueling planes to support that infrastructure. So anytime you take a look at the total capability of a union, you have to look at what is it that they have at their disposal. So if you should compare the European Union, then you should do it on an equal terms with the United States and, for example, China. It's so totally wrong to just compare, say, France with the entire United States. That's not even an equal thing. If you want to break it down by the states, you have to compare it state to state. For example, Sweden is about the same size as California, but it doesn't have the same strengths or economy as California. Or little Luxembourg, which is almost like a small city. You can't compare that with, you know, uh, I don't know, Texas. So you have to always compare things equal. And that's why you should compare the European Union with similar areas. But if you want to break things down and say, I want to compare the state of Wisconsin with the state of, say, um, Italy, that's a better comparison. So overall, the European Union is incredibly strong. However, their people are not commingled in a way or, you know, th that they would actually support each other in the same way as, for example, China, Russia, or the United States. The language barriers and cultural barriers are still too large. Now, how the European Union is organized is very interesting, and it might need a little bit of explanation. So we have a legislative branch that looks at uh, concepts and ideas that will perhaps turn into law. They have the executive branch that really has all the power to make decisions. And naturally, they have the legal part, the uh, judicial part of the government as well. So let's look at the part where the people have the most say in, but maybe not the most power. There's naturally always a struggle between this right of the states versus the European Union as a whole. So you have uh, 
the issues like in the United States where you have the federal government and the state governments. Who is responsible for what? Another part that's interesting is that the central banks, each state has their own central bank. So where the United States has 12 federal reserve banks, the central bank of the European Union has each state is a district and they all meet together and they're part of the European Central Bank. Now, they have limited amounts of power, what they can and cannot do, and very strict re uh, regulation on how to conduct monetary policy. So there's many ways where a state can influence the European Union. One, they have the national parliaments uh, who have their representatives typically through their head of states to the European Council. They have members uh, from all the different states on legislation. They have lots more members that is look uh, engaged and um, uh, work hard inside the European Parliament. And naturally you have the districts of the different central banks. So it ends up being a very huge, complicated, heavy bureaucracy. We will cover the euro and currencies more in other chapters. However, we're going to take a quick look at it right here. The euro is the single currency of the European Monetary Union, which was adopted by 11 member states on January 1st, 1999. The original members were Belgium, Germany, Spain, France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Finland, Austria, Portugal, and the Netherlands. This is an older map of the Eurozone. Now, the United Kingdom is listed as a EU member, but that has naturally changed since. Now, the ones that are not a part of the Eurozone is Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Czech, Hungary, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and some might adopt it at a later point. So there's rules on how you can adopt it and when you might have to adopt it, depending on how you negotiate it upon joining the European Union. So all the European Union member states are part of the European uh, Economic and Monetary Union, EMU, and coordinate their economic policies, making it a way to support the economic aims of the European Union as one nation. The Eurozone, officially called the Euro area, is a monetary union of 19 out of 27 European Union members. The numbers might have changed. Uh, state, uh, since um, I uh, adopted this um, picture, uh, and these nation states have adopted the Euro as their common currency and sole legal tender. There's no one else competing with that currency. The monetary authority of the euro zone is the euro system. The European Central Bank, or ECB, which is governed by a president and a board of the heads of national central banks, sets the monetary policy for the entire zone. The principal task of the European Central Bank is to keep inflation under control. They were very concerned about inflation in the old days, and that's why they built such a rigorous way of conducting monetary policy. So there is no common representation, governance, or fiscal policy for the uh, European uh, Union or the currency. It still works hard together to keep it under 2% inflation. During the financial crisis of 2008, they identified the need of actually having a euro bond. The euro bond is a very important tool for a central bank as the ECB to be able to influence the money supply. So the European Union focused very hard on not having a lot of inflation. In fact, just keeping it under 2%, a very narrow range. Okay, So that limits their ability to actually print money as a way to uh, create money supply or increase inflation. Traditionally, uh, central banks has the ability to buy and sell bonds to increase or decrease money supply. 
Central banks can naturally change the reserve requirements, but that is seldom used. The main uh, tool that the European Central Bank has had and used is changing the interest rates. But the tool that they use the most is probably communication. Now, something that they need to work harder on, uh, and they're probably doing that, is uh, the ability to buy and sell bonds. So the European Union does not have a formal constitution. However, they have a lot of treaties that all look like a constitution. An important document is the Treaty of Lisbon from 2007. The purpose is to make each EU member more democratic and makes the whole union more efficient and better to address global problems such as climate change, uh, war, uh, and the ability to, to act as one voice. The Treaty of Nice, in, um, ratified in uh, 2003, had the purpose to reform the institutions of the European Union so they can function more efficiently after they reach 25 members. The Treaty of Amsterdam from 1997, that actually came in place in 1999, was actually a reform to prepare the European Union to accept new future members. A big one is the Treaty of the European Union, the Maastricht Treaty. It came in place in 1993 and it was intended to prepare the European Monetary Union and introduce elements of a political union where citizenship, common foreign and international affairs were unified. The Schengel Treaty or Convention from 1985 has been amended several times, but the core of it is the free flow of money, people, and goods and services. All these treaties have often been suggested to be put together as one constitution for the European Union, but typically uh, Ireland, Denmark, and perhaps Sweden would complain and other countries will complain as well and then put force a veto against the whole concept of having a constitution. So for now, all these documents are seen as treaties and will not be called constitution. The big part of the European Union is that it initially was founded as the coal and steel union where uh, France and Germany and the little countries here in between that got squeezed during World War I and World War II uh, had the right to inspect each other's steel and coal production because you needed those two components to rage war. And so it was really a huge peace process. So if you talk to older generations uh, of the European Union, they will never say anything bad about the Euro Eurozone because they knew that the conflicts of old was causing more trouble than good. So the European Union will always be an important part of maintaining peace in this general area here which is you know pretty much all of Europe so that peace and prosperity will keep going I hope you enjoyed learning about the European Union it's a wonderful peace project that they have going for them and I hope they will succeed and I hope you will learn how to operate within the European Union so that you can do business over there besides just doing business in the United States Together, we will probably win, big time.